Quiet on the set. Take one. My name is Nikia Colombi. I'm an actress and a ballerina. So you're an actress and a ballerina. Why do you do that? Well, um, I'd have to say because I love it. I love both of them. I was a, a ballerina first, but I think that acting has a large impact on a dancer's performance. And now I've kind of branched off and I'm acting without the dancing. And they're both just incredible. It's why I get out of bed in the morning. What do you enjoy about dancing? You say acting and dancing sort of go together. What is the main thing you enjoy about dancing? For me, dancing, particularly ballet, is mostly about um, the foundation that it's given me. Uh, I like the repetition and the challenge and working physically to obtain a goal. Um, and then the acting, it goes with it it allows you to take this physical ability that you've worked so long to perfect and really turn it into a story. And I think the difference between a, a good dancer and a great dancer is that a good dancer can maybe do 36 fuetes on point, but a great dancer can do that same step in character. Would you say that when you do dance, do you dance for yourself or do you dance for other people? I definitely dance for myself. Um, I actually prefer probably being in the studio and working on a piece and finding different ways to do it than performing, actually. When you act, how much of yourself do you put into your character? I put everything into my character. Um, I am not formally trained as an actor, but if, um, I had to, if I had to specify, I would say I'm definitely a method actor. Uh, so when I'm working on a part, I really, my entire lifestyle for that period of time changes. Um, and I'll start kind of acting like that character outside of filming uh, and just in everyday life to kind of see the world through that character's eyes. For those of us who don't know what method acting is, what is a method actor? Method acting is basically putting yourself in the exact positions and situations that your character would be put into. Um, in basic, if your character is, let's say, um, a professional athlete, you would, to the best of your ability, become that professional athlete for the amount of time that you were playing that character. Or, um, I mean, sometimes it's difficult to do. Obviously, if you're playing a serial killer, which I did about a month ago, I just wrapped on a feature film where I was playing a serial killer. I couldn't go out and actually do that. But to the best of your ability, you immerse yourself in that surrounding and that character and really look at the world the way that character would. Do you feel that that takes a toll on you when you look at the world the way your character is? For example, the serial killer. Like, does that really get to you? Does that bother you? It does, a little bit. Uh, there was, it was definitely a big change. Um, it affects more your personal relationships than anything else. Uh, I mean, it's great for work, but as far as friendships and relationships go, it can be a little strenuous, especially uh, when you're playing a darker character like that. Um, I know I would go out with my friends after shooting or maybe about the week before shooting and I couldn't be the happy, exuberant person that I usually am when I go out with my friends. I was much more reserved and kind of quiet and it was a little bit difficult to break out of that character really quickly. And how did your friends take that? Uh, some better than others. <laughs> um, we got through it though. I mean, I still have all of my friends. It was just, it definitely took, I think, some getting used to for them. And there were a couple of weeks, especially during shooting, where I, I couldn't really hang out with them as much. How did you get started being an actor? Um, actually, my best friend was, she had a smaller role in a short film that was shooting in Philadelphia. And I had broken my leg dancing. This was last December. Um, I had broken my leg during a Nutcracker performance and my friend had to leave to go home. Um, her grandmother was ill and she had to leave, couldn't do the film, and had referred me to the director. She said she's a great actress, she, she dances, you want her for this part. So actually the first film that I was in, I was 
Um, I played my character on crutches and in a cast for the entire film. <laughs> so that, that wasn't in the script? No, no, originally it was not. They added it in though. How do you feel uh, Philadelphia is for the arts as far as acting and dancing? I love it. Um, I talk to a lot of people. I, I actually work in New York a lot too, and I get that question a lot from actors who are based out of New York. Um, I love Philadelphia because it's close enough to New York that you can still work there. It opens up a whole other market though. Uh, and Philadelphia as a whole is, it's a little bit of a smaller community, but um, I feel like it gives an actor the ability to develop their skills. It's not as cutthroat as a, of a market as maybe New York or LA, but there's enough professional work that you can really learn and maybe hone your craft before going there. And I'm, I'm super glad that I started out here because it's, uh, it's given me a lot of opportunities that I don't think I would have had otherwise. With all the other things that are happening in the world, with, with, with homelessness, with unemployment, uh, with war, with the economy, how important is the arts, specifically your acting and your dancing, how important is that to you? I think it's incredibly important. Um, that is, it's a big reason why I love doing what I do. Um, there are many different ways to affect the world and to change situations and people and to simply be a way for someone to relax at the end of the day watching an action movie or to be the inspiring character that you know gives them a reason to change something in their life. Um, that's huge and it makes it worth it. Where do you see yourself in five years? <laughs> um, I have no idea. Hopefully I'll be, I'll be acting and, and dancing still, but where I'll be and how I'll be doing it is kind of up in the air. And I like that. I love not knowing where I'll be next year, next month, even tomorrow, really. <laughs> so in your opinion, what are some steps that aspiring dancers and actors can take um, to climb the ladder? Well, having good training and um, building a foundation and really having the ability to do anything you may be asked to do in an audition is very, very important. If the talent isn't there, it's not possible. But once you have that and you're comfortable with your craft, um, it's really important to make connections. Networking is huge. Um, and there's a hundred different ways you can go about doing it. I mean, some actors like to go out and get a manager as soon as they possibly can, which is great, and it works really well for some people. Um, others I've seen just go out and um, they try as hard as they can to have a face-to-face -face interaction with as many directors and other actors as they possibly can. And um, especially with casting on, as I found, independent films and smaller budget films, directors really like to work with people that they know and are comfortable working with. Um, the feature film that I just finished working on, I was the only actor that they cast that they hadn't worked with previously. My boss said you're the man for the job. But I'm unavailable. You have 10 seconds to change your mind. I'll give you five seconds to remove your hand. I insist on using only the best man for this assignment. Don't think of this as just another job. Think of it as a mission. One condition. I drive my own car. We changed the oil, gave it a tune-up, took out all the non-essentials. I thought you might like company. You want to tell me what this is all about? When you pass 75 feet from the car, complete the mission, save your life. You didn't mention you bring company. It's complicated. With you, it's always complicated. On November 26th, fasten your seatbelt. They're going to kill us! Not. You really should think more positive. Step away from the vehicle. You've disappointed me. I've been thinking any idiot with a driver's license will do.
have fired. Jason Statham. You think we're playing games, Frank? A little late for one is though, you think? One more step, Frank. Come on, one more. Transporter 3. People ask the question, what's a rock and roller? And I'll tell them. We all like a bit of good life. Some the money or the fame, but a real rock and roller. Once a lot. There's no school like the old school, and I'm their master. Right, let me tell you how this works. You're going in the drink, and I'm going to have a cup of tea. I just hope for your sakes you can hold your breath for as long as it takes my kettle to boil. All right, see ya. Times are changing. They ain't no respecters of the old school. What's it going to cost me? Seven million euros. Call the accountant. Any seven million euros. Seven million. Well, what do you want? You. Dance? You're a dancer. Am I a dancer? I've got some work. Seven million euros, and it won't be protected. Is this a robbery? Yes, it is a robbery. Ah. Where's reverse? You have to lift up the knob and the gear stick. Got you. Troubled rock star Johnny Quid is missing or soon dead. Bards, Annie? If he's dead, that's the third time this year. I'm dead, Pete. Dead people don't like company. Your boy ain't dead, is he? Find him. We got your boy. You might want to hose him down. He smells like a rotten goat. I run this town. Ah! And bring the troops. Bring me a body. <laughs> a blanket ship! Well, you didn't realize that they had guns? Was war criminals attached to the trigger? <laughs> you know what they call a real rock and roller? Rock and roller? Rock and roller. Rock and roller. You are the only one. You are gonna take care of them. What do you think we are? Gangsters? Rock and roller. Don't worry, he can't defend himself, he's got no head. One by one. They step forward. A nurse. A teacher. A homemaker. And lives are saved. But the problem is enormous. Every three seconds, one person dies. Of starvation. AIDS. Poverty. Aid groups. Are uniting as one. But we need your help. One more person. Letter. Voice can spell the difference. Americans have an unprecedented opportunity to make poverty history. Please visit one at this address. One.org. Hi, I'm Nanette Langford. And I'm Tony Langford. And you're watching Tony Langford's Downtown, the Actors' Lounge. My name is Roy Smiles and I'm a playwright. It's about a fictitious meeting between Groucho Marx, a legendary comic from Marx Brothers in the 30s, and Lenny Bruce, the 50s and 60s, a shock comedian who uh, died in 66. And it's set in a diner during the New York blackout of 1965, where they come to, they never actually met in real life, but they meet in the play, and they sort of vie for the soul of a young comedian who's loosely based on uh, Woody Allen. Uh, I had a really sort of funky auntie, and when I was about eight, she let me stay up late one night for the Marx Brothers, a uh, night in Casablanca, and I just became addicted with them. Me and my brother used to lop around the house doing, um, marry me and I'll never look at another horse, and all the jokes. And uh, I just always loved them. 
and I was doing stand-up comedy. I kind of got into Lenny Bruce, listening to Lenny Bruce just to help inspire me with, my, what, with the sort of material I was doing. I just thought it would be interesting clash of cultures, old Jewish comedy against the new guy on the block, the new kid on the block who was foul-mouthed, you know, and trap him in a room during a blackout and all hell breaks loose. Um, I'd done stand-up comedy, so I'd always written my own material, but I was a dreadful stand-up comic. I was more of a stand-up manic depressive, as I used to say. And I got into a long-running musical, a dreadful musical set in the 60s, where I played a pill-popping mod whose big number was about throwing up, and it was like slow death, and I had to do eight shows a week. And just to keep myself sane, I started writing plays, and uh, this was the first one that I ever got on. Well, the, the, the last play was so English because it was about a radio troupe called The Goons and Peter Sellers was the only real famous one that you guys had heard of. So I was kind of surprised to have that on in America because it's such an English play. But this is, this is brilliant because um, it's about two American icons, so I'm really looking forward to the American uh, audience's response. But they treated me like a king, they fly me over, they, they take me to Irish bars, what more can I ask for? It's kind of it's just a different style of comedy. It's you, you, you trying to pay, kind of pace things a lot slower in English comedy and have a lot more monologues. American, it's that sort of dead end kids, Abbott and Costello, da -da 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 -da, sort of rhythm to the to the dialogue. So when I do an American play, it's a lot faster, which it kind of suits my style, I think. Uh, as somebody said that I was like a cross between Donald o, Donald O'Connor in um, Singing in the Rain and Lenny Bruce. So I was very manic, I'd lose about a stone, I was very nervous and twitchy and uh, I wasn't very good, I was like, I made a living but just. So one night, the, the reason I gave up is I was late for a gig and the guy went, you're on, you're on and I rushed out on stage in front of about 250 people and I said, uh, my name is, and I blanked, I'd forgot my act and my name and I did the gag and you look inside your jacket yeah. and I said, what the hell's my name and I thought, I'm in the wrong business and I can't remember my name so I, I got out and got into acting and, and started writing. Sometimes you get frustrated when the actors are doing your lines and they're not doing them the way you want to and there's, there's nothing like doing your own lines in front of 200 people and they're all laughing because that's you doing your thing. But by the same degree, if you're bombing and failing and nobody's laughing or heckling you, they're rejecting your material and you as well. So it's kind of heaven and hell. But yeah, part of me misses the, the performing. In England, I still occasionally, I'm, I'm in one of my own plays occasionally, but mostly abroad, it's, 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 it's other actors. Yeah, in South Africa, opened last night, a uh, play about the Python team. Um, I've, I've had uh, plays on about uh, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore, and I've, I've got a few in the bag as well. So, um, it's, it's my obsession. I, I've always, uh, I was always the class clown, obviously, and um, then getting into stand-up comedy, and then I, I've tried writing serious plays, and they're kind of pompous and morbid, and my friends read them and go, Jesus. Let it go. So I, I, I'm a comedy monkey boy. I, I, I just write comedy. I, I like cheering people up. So. It's going to be wild and unpredictable evening. We've got uh, a, 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 a secret character that's going to turn up, and it's just I think they'll be fascinated by the clash between Groucho's one-liners and Lenny's hyper '60s jazz speak. It's it's interesting culture clash, and it's it's very funny. Lots of very funny one-liners. Okay. I hope. Just the buzz, the buzz of creativity. I, I, I notoriously laugh at my own jokes all through rehearsals this week. I've been mean, thawing at my own gags. I just I love creating a, a really well structured sentence which ends with a laugh. It's, I don't think there's anything like it. I just I, I adore it, and I, I've been doing it now for the best part of 20 years, and it's just, it's just my joy. Um, I, I've got a big thing about theatre not being too long, so keep it under two hours. And just try, don't, life's like we're doing with back and forward conversation, just don't write endless monologues, don't bore your audience, let each character speak with their own character, and just make sure everyone on stage has, has got a really juicy part to do, otherwise they sit backstage complaining about the playwright. But no, no I, I don't know, um, it's, it's, if you can get your plays on, it's, it's, it's a beautiful experience, it's social, and it's, it's fantastic hearing that. Because you'll do a TV thing, you, you don't know how the audience can react. When you've got 300 people, like this is about 350 seater, yeah. and you've got 350 people raising the roof of one of your lines. There's, there's just no feeling in the world, it's brilliant. 
because people have pointed out when I said, oh, you've written about Lenny Bruce or George Orwell. Boy, that's you. I, I, I pour loads. I, it's, it's, I, I pour over. I get over obsessive, you know. I, some, a couple of years ago, because I had a kid, I'd, I had to sort of start having weekends off and just calming down because it was almost too important. But I, I tend to pour my life and soul. And if it would take a year to write a play, I'm just uh, obsessed, obsessed with it. And then the rehearsal process is brilliant as well because I, I just love the, the debate with the actors and should we keep that line out? Is there a funnier gag to end? I, I, the whole process uh, thrills and fascinates me. So I've, I've been here from when the cast read the script the first time and we've spent a week on, on the script. Because obviously being English, there's certain things I think are American that go, well, we've never said that in our lives. So we have to go through and sort of take out all the Englishness in the script. And then sometimes an actors will be on the feet and they'll, they'll be mucking about and they'll come up with a better line. I've never had a huge ego about it, going, oh, that's a good line, we'll, we'll use that. He's uh, just to, to, to champion me, because I'm deeply obscure in England. It, and, but he'd heard about Ying Tong from the Australian production when it was at Sydney Opera House. So take a risk on an English playwright you'd never heard of in a, in a play from Australia, which was about uh, an English theatre group nobody knew here. The Ying Tong, it's just fantastic. And then they had a workshop of um, this while I was here in April. I said, oh, come back. I was on me? Twice in a, twice in a year? <laughs> so just brilliant. My God, he's, he's such a nice guy. You know? Of course, all the Europeans are crazy. <laughs> Well, I was, I've been trying to think of a play about John Wayne for a long time, but I just can't, I can't find a humour to it. So again, the South Africans asked me about doing something about Woody Allen, so I'm, I'm thinking about uh, trying, to, trying to piece about Woody. So, once more. Again, just looked off me a commission, so it's, it's, it's nice. Even though I swore to my agent I would never write another play about comedians. <laughs> my name is Roy Smiles, and I'm a playwright. Perfect. <laughs> I've never said that before. <laughs> Whatever in my life. <laughs>
turn it into whatever you want it to be. You get to take the character anywhere that you see the character going and you're acting from the moment you walk in the door, which is, it's just fun. Um, it's a challenge and a lot of times you don't get a role for uh, reasons that are outside of your control, but it's just fun and I love auditioning. So tell us about the charity event that you're working on. Um, well, my boyfriend is uh, one of the co-owners on Q Productions and his company and myself and a local band, The Model, and um, local musician and rapper Schooly D are getting together to throw a charity event to raise money for the Natural Resources Defense Council's Polar Bear SOS campaign. Um, I think polar bears in particular are maybe not the cause of our event, but just educating people on the, the current state of our, our wildlife and our natural resources and um, the effects of global warming and drilling in Alaska. And, um, throwing a fun event where maybe we can just get a couple more people to understand what's going on and just educate them a little bit more on the effects of things that they're doing every day is a help. So if you weren't in the arts, where would you be? I would probably be a doctor. Uh, I actually had a, a period of time in high school where I decided that I didn't want to dance and I didn't want to act and I wanted nothing to do with the arts and I was done with it. And um, I spent the summer between my junior and senior year of high school studying molecular, cellular, and developmental biology at Yale. And I loved it, but I missed dancing and acting too much. Any words of advice for any uh, aspiring dancers and actors that are watching this right now? My advice would be to follow your dreams, because more than anything, that's really, really important. And don't ever let anyone tell you that you can't do it, because I think determination is probably the most important factor in someone's career.